Hello everyone. So, in this video, what I would like to do is to jointly explore issues surrounding the historical content um, for three of these poems, the first three in the collection, which is to say Ozymandias, London, and the extract from the prelude, um, with a view to looking at how that can inform our interpretation of these poems, particularly in terms of what we might call the authorial intent, the writer's purpose. And so I suppose then there are six main areas that I'm going to focus on in the course of this presentation. First of all, changing ideas about childhood and growing up. Second of all, the Industrial Revolution and its impact on the landscape. The sublime and the changing relationship with nature. Uh, the French Revolution and the rise of Napoleon. Um, authority, repression and freedom as concepts explored at this time. And finally, in a more literary context, um, the status and the role of what were called, or came to be known as, the Romantic Poets themselves. So, let's move on then to look at the first slide. So, first of all then, let's think about childhood. Now, to start at the bottom of this slide, uh, the medieval doctrine about uh, childhood, which is something that goes back to Christianity itself, is this idea that children were born with sin and that you had to cleanse them of it, which is why, for example, being baptised was so important. And similarly, why very often in documents of the time, you'll find that children were being baptised, for example, the day after birth, in order that you could cleanse them of this sin as soon as possible. The original sin itself was seen to be the sin of Eve, the giving in of temptation. Um, that doesn't actually concern us, but it simply explains, if you like, the opposite of what the views that became current at this time were. So, the key figure then is this Jean-Jacques Rousseau, this French philosopher of the middle of the 18th century, which is to say the 1700s. And in a, an essay which he wrote called The Social Contract from 1762, the most famous quotation is this one here, Man is born free, yet everywhere he is in chains. In other words, he is the originator of what we can call this dichotomy, this opposite relationship between innocence and experience. The idea that children are born innately good, innocent, and it is the influence of society that corrupts them, that turns people into wicked sinners. That was his view. However, it wasn't something, therefore, that's as simple as children good, adults bad, um, because he particularly thought that it was Western society, Western increasingly in industrialising society, that was so damaging. Uh, and so one of the things that this therefore led to is that there was an idea in the 18th century of something known very patronisingly as the noble savage. Now if you look at the illustration on the right of this slide, you'll see a, 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 a watercolour that was made by the artist on Captain Cook's voyage of exploration to the Pacific. Um, in, I think, the 1770s, and in a sense, this is what we see. This is a figure of um, a, an Aboriginal warrior, but idealised. He's seen here to be lean, to be muscular, to be handsome, and wielding this enormous harpoon. Um, he um, is an idealised figure because there was this idea that these people who were not living in these westernised societies, but living on these islands in the Pacific, there was an idea that they were somehow innocent, that they had been uncorrupted by the influence of Western society. So that's where that idea comes from. Um, but to take now the picture on the left by uh, Thomas Gainsborough, one of the most famous portrait artists of the 18th century, just gives us an idea of how, in this case, children are uh, idealised. See here, this you know, sort of rather pretty, sad-looking young girl with her broken pot, her poverty, her ragged clothing, 
but the affection she's shown is capable of um, feeling the love towards this pet dog. So, here we have it then. The journey from childhood innocence to uh, experience corrupted by the adult world. And we see this as well as in the poems. We see this a lot, for example, in uh, Dickens, in A Christmas Carol. The idea that uh, his... Um, Scrooge's childhood is this time of innocence, um, which is then destroyed as he comes out into the world. And we see it in Blood Brothers too, where the brothers' innocence uh, and lack of class consciousness, for example, um, is damaged by their exposure to society. So, that's the first key um, idea that we uh, see here. And, and later in this presentation I'll talk about how this relates to Blake particularly. Um, but also to Wordsworth as well. Right then, so the next thing then, the Industrial Revolution. Now, obviously we all know what this is, um, the harnessing, uh, first of all of water and then latterly of steam power um, in order to uh, fuel these great factories that were being built um, for the manufacture of things like, well, all manner of things, cloth, um, w w w wool, cotton, and so on, um, that you know fuel this enormous boom in prosperity, in national prosperity, for some. Um, of course, there is a side effect to this: is that um, as these factories begin to be built, they begin to draw in workers from the surrounding countryside, and so we see this. Um, phenomenon of sudden and rapid urbanisation. Um, villages grow into towns, towns grow into cities, and um, without the sanitation or, for example, even things like the churches or any of the facilities or infrastructure needed to support um, life, the conditions in these cities very quickly became very bleak. Um, and I've chosen to illustrate that with two images here. The first one on the right um, is by a much underrated artist called Joseph Wright of Derby. Um, and what he is depicting here is an early industrial landscape by night. It looks for all the world, doesn't it, as if we're witnessing some kind of disaster here um, with these blazing clouds. And yet what he's actually showing is a factory working at night. Um, but it's no secret, or rather it's no coincidence, that he uses these apocalyptic colours because I think he's trying to show us the shocking effects of this new um, industrialization. Uh, the excellent image on the left um, by a painter called William Wilde actually is rather later. Uh, it's called Manchester from Kensal Moor. Um, it's a view taken from outside the city looking in. And as I say, it is later, this is from the 19th century. But it's very, very good because it contrasts, on the one hand, the sort of pastoral idyll of this uh, foreground, um, which, if you like, perhaps represents the past, the more rural past. Um, but contrasted against the background, you see the horizon filled with mills, filled with chimneys, all belching out smoke. Um, and... As I said, we've all read A Christmas Carol. We all know about the kind of conditions that uh, were created in these um, in these new towns. Um, as a final note, on the subject again of the Joseph Wright image on the right, um, it's no secret, I think, or no coincidence, again, that it's a very sublime um, image here that is shown, this enormous gulfing clouds of smoke and flame um, really do show the power of the new industrialization and you'll see on the next slide what that's equated to now if you look at the bottom right image again on this slide this is another painting actually by joseph wright of derby but this time it is of the bay of naples what we're looking at here is the volcano mount vesuvius in eruption and isn't it interesting how this very sublime image of the natural world is depicted so similarly to, uh, and even down to the colour palette, to the way that, that he uh, depicted uh, the industrial scene in similarly sublime terms. 
Now that leads me then on to a consideration of the sublime. Now it's worth just backtracking for a second. Now the predominant view of the uh, landscape that we have before this time is uh, an idea known as the pastoral, which is to say this idealized view of a tamed, safe, natural landscape. And it's a very old idea, it goes back to the Greeks and Romans. Pastor itself is a Latin word, means a shepherd. Um, and so it, it, it literally the idea of a shepherd tending his flocks it relates in this kind of metaphorical way to the idea of these controlled landscapes um, and that evolved slightly in the uh, 18th century there's an idea called the picturesque as well um, so there is a growing sense of a, a, a landscape that um, that's worthy of attention but still very much in that tame way even something that's picturesque literally something that looks scenic um, and that's emphasized by the image on the top right here which is a landscape by a French watercolorist called Claude Lorraine who was hugely popular in 18th century England but you see here this gentle rather backward looking landscape the slowly flowing river um, you have a herd with his um, uh, his cows or oxen uh, and a few sheep it's a comfortable image very much in contrast to the very sublime aggression of the joseph rice image below but what is the sublime this idea of conflictingly dramatic emotions mingle things like awe terror and admiration terrible beauty is a good way to sum up the kind of juxtaposition um, or almost perhaps the paradox that's at the heart of this idea it's this idea of a thrill of excitement which is simultaneously frightening you might compare it to a modern roller coaster for example um, and one um, image which I'd like to uh, illustrate is by I think a German uh, artist called Caspar David Friedrich um, but it, uh, it's called something like the philosopher on the mountain and it depicts I think the new willingness of people to go out and to appreciate this kind of landscape around them. Now before this time, wild landscapes had been seen as something to be avoided at all costs. They were dangerous, they were frightening, they were terrifying. When uh, travellers crossed the Alps, it used to be the uh, tradition apparently that they would draw down the blinds of their carriages so that they didn't even have to look at this terrifying landscape outside um, that's the kind of view that used to predate this period but instead at uh, this time these new movements like the romantics actively loved it and that's why for example um, areas like the lake district that area that's so associated with william wordsworth um, start to attract attention for the first time as if, you know beauty spots and places worthy of interest in their own right rather than simply as places to be avoided at all costs. Um, places like the Highlands of Scotland, Exmoor, these kinds of, of, of places um, become of interest for the first time. Um, why is this of interest? Well, I think we have to link it to industrialization. When the landscape around you is so rapidly becoming changed, built over, dug up for mining, um, whatever that might be, uh, spoiled with pollution, for example. When the landscape is being so rapidly damaged, I think it's a very natural uh, reaction that you start to look for things that seem to be wild and untamed, a reminder that humanity cannot ruin everything. Now, to move on then to another point of, uh, of relevance here then, the French Revolution. Now, we see this begin in 1789 with these relatively noble aims, liberté, égalité, fraternité, that is to say freedom, equality, brotherhood, sorry, no sisterhood, unfortunately, um, but uh, obviously, as we all know, soon turns to violence and to infighting, and even the revolutionaries themselves start executing each other, not even content to simply uh, execute the aristocrats from the time before. Um, 
and the consequences here are illustrated in two very conflicting paintings of the um, guillotine. Now, the first at the top, I suppose, is very much a kind of revolutionary view in the sense that you see um, an aristocrat about to be beheaded in a very calm um, sort of scene in a square with these uh, uh, ancient looking um, buildings in the Greek style, the, the, the neoclassical Greek style with those triangular um, pediments they're called, the triangular porches that look like something from the, the Parthenon in, uh, in Greece, in, in ancient Athens. Um, but we also see below here another very contrasting view of this and it's on the face of it it's a very similar scene we're looking at somebody being guillotined and yet see again how it's these apocalyptic colors that we saw in joseph wright's um images a moment ago that are being used here this looks not like a scene from a city square but a scene from hell um it's shown to be the unleashing of wild and natural landscape Instead of being on a wooden platform, the guillotine is on what looks like an outcrop of rock. Um, instead of it being in a perfectly pleasant weather, we're seeing this sort of apocalyptic, stormy situation. It looks like perhaps there's some kind of fire ablaze. Um, and instead of merely seeing somebody about to be executed, we can actually see the executioner holding up the severed head. Um, so it just represents the uh, the way in which this noble attempt so very quickly turned um, unpleasant uh, and indeed many people who began with revolutionary sentiments very quickly began to realize that what had been unleashed was something that was actually very dangerous and very damaging now after the french revolution towards the end of the uh, 1790s what we start to see then is the rise of Napoleon uh, as a uh, figure, somebody who begins as a humble artillery officer, uh, the child of Italian immigrants uh, to Corsica in fact, and so not even from mainland France, somewhere that really had the status of a colony in itself. Um, but by 1799 he rises through this chaos um, to be a general and then to become what is known as the first consul, I suppose perhaps the nearest equivalent to being a sort of prime minister, although there wasn't a queen or any other head of state, because of course they'd executed their, their, their king and queen. Um, but nonetheless, he becomes the first consul of France. And not merely that, not merely is he content to be leader in name, but in 1804 he crowns himself the Emperor of France. Um, and this painting here by Jacques-Louis David uh, shows that moment. It's worth just looking, though, at some of the iconography that we see here. Because, of course, the revolution was all about ripping away the trappings of the old aristocracy and the old monarchy. And yet, the magnificence of this scene here clearly shows how that has all been turned upon its head by the arrogance and the hubris and the ambition of Napoleon. And even the architecture here, we look at these uh, columns, for example. Um, again, this is very much in um, a neoclassical style, but in this case it's a neo-Roman, these round arches like this, um, rather than the, the Greek style we saw on the other buildings. But again, there's a very deliberate attempt here by Napoleon to equate himself with the great civilizations and specifically the great empire of the past i.e rome it's a measure of the arrogance that he has um however like um uh, as we all know uh, having talked about tragedy um the trouble with people's arrogance and ambition and hubris is that of course it comes with consequences now, in the bottom right of this slide, I have picked out a detail from the painting you saw on the previous page, and the two things I will draw your attention to. First of all, see the figure of Napoleon there, uh, standing just to the right of centre. Um, see the fact that it's not merely that he is being crowned empire, emperor, but the fact that he is crowning himself. The fact that he considers that no church has the authority to 
give this to him, it is something that he has earned in his own right. That is what hubris looks like. Now he commissioned this painting himself, and apparently he was very um, uh, he was very much in touch with it during the painting stage. He wanted to get all the details right, and so it's ironic, isn't it, that details like this that he rather thought reflected on his own glory, in fact, tell us just as much about his um, failings and the seeds of his own downfall. Um, what else then? Well, two other images. The top one here um, is a depiction of his retreat from Moscow in, in 1812, frustrated at his, or so the story goes, frustrated at his lack of success against um, the uh, English army in the West. The English army was fighting through Portugal and Spain at that time. He decides to invade Russia. Um, much like Hitler 230 years later, uh, it is catastrophic. Um, he uh, is defeated by the Russian winter. And so this scene here, showing his retreat back, um, you see, for example, his, his, his soldiers bent, stooped, struggling, covered in snow, tramping over the bodies of their own dead comrades. You see, for example, there, there's a cart which is overturned in a ditch. Um, so it's very useful because, again, it highlights the perils of hubris. It highlights... Um, the consequences of uh, Napoleon's terrible arrogance and ambition. Um, the painting to the bottom left, entitled Napoleon Before the Sphinx, actually is later, um, and no one knows whether the uh, confrontation that it depicts here is actually um, true or not. Certainly Napoleon had been in Egypt at the head of a French army in the 1790s, and indeed was one of the first people responsible for opening up the country um, to Western uh, influence and exploration, and in fact, he he also brought back a number of uh, art objects to Paris um, at the time, which I think again showed just how conscious he was about wanting to borrow the glory of old empires. Um, but it's interesting here that this artist has chosen to show Napoleon in such a diminutive scale when confronted by the great head of the Sphinx, this great symbol of the ancient Egyptian, because it reminds us of Napoleon's own weakness, and indeed, by the time it was painted, of the fact that he himself had been defeated and uh, fallen, just as the Egyptian empires that that Sphinx represents had also fallen. Because the problem with empires is they rise, but they also fall, and very often the seeds of their own destruction are within their own success. So, by 1815, at the Battle of Waterloo, uh, Napoleon is uh, defeated by the uh, English Duke of Wellington, who is leading a combined force uh, alongside Dutch and Prussian, which was a, a German state, and, and Prussian troops as well. This um, depicts the moment at the uh, almost at the end of the battle where he sensed that uh, an allied victory was coming and where he waved forward his troops for the final advance that won the day um, and another picture on the right another fantasy but it rather captures doesn't it the uh, the singular dejection of napoleon um, uh, knowing that finally he had been defeated for the last time a warning then against the perils of um, ambition. Now, the next theme then, um, ideas about authority and repression, linking back slightly to what we just said about Napoleon. Now, during those wars against France, which with a couple of brief interruptions were continuous from 1792 to uh, 1815. I think there were perhaps two or three brief interludes within that time of, of, tr of truces that never lasted, but essentially you're looking at um, that period of continuous war. Um, but the British governments and successive British governments were deeply concerned about the revolution um, and about the fact that it might spread across the channel, that you might see scenes in England 
where you had the people revolting against the aristocracy and the government. Deeply concerned about that. And although those fears lessened somewhat when it became clear after uh, 1799 and even more so after 1804 that we were fighting against a genuine tyrant in Napoleon, nonetheless these fears um, continued. Um, and the governments uh, enforced deeply repressive measures, um, particularly um, a law from 1714 known as the Riot Act, um, which allowed for the banning of all meetings of more than 12 people. Um, so it was designed to prevent uh, people attending any kind of political meeting or rally, um, anything like that. Uh, and in fact, the penalty for this um, was so severe that it could include um, the death penalty. Um, and although the death penalty um, was eventually repealed, the actual law itself remained on the English statute books until 1973. Um, incidentally, some of you may have heard the phrase to read the Riot Act. It's quite often used in sport, for example, to describe a final warning. Um, and it refers to the fact that uh, in the Act there was a particular warning which had to be read out by an authority figure to the crowds, warning them to disperse, and of course of the consequences being that if they did not disperse, um, the Act allowed for force to be used without consequences. Now, during the wars against Napoleon, uh, the economy largely boomed because of the industry building lots of ships, uh, uniforms, weapons, and so on. Um, however, after 1815, at the end of that war, the economy contracts, there is a large recession, lots of people become unemployed, and uh, the governments become increasingly worried because, of course, that leads to social unrest. So, rather than the governments of the time doing anything to assist this mood of um, uh, of unrest and discontentment, what they actually do is become even more repressive and it sparks fears actually that instead of um, preventing a revolution it might even encourage one. Now this picture on the right here comes from 1819 and it depicts um, a massacre near Manchester called uh, at a place called St Peter's Fields um, where uh, a group of um, people, uh, many thousands of people, gathered to hear a, uh, speakers talking about uh, things like universal suffrage, which is to say uh, people having the right to vote. Um, the Riot Act was read, and then what you see here is mounted soldiers, cavalry, charging into the crowd um, and again as this cap that's the figures in blue and again as this captures quite vividly laying about them with their swords and got this quite dramatic juxtaposition between on the one hand these uh, soldiers on horses and the poor beaten down um, peasants who are the subject of this attack now one of the clauses of the riot act actually said that um, once it had been read um, the government was not responsible for any damage caused. In other words, the uh, soldiers enforcing the Riot Act had a complete freedom of action, um, which of course obviously is very damaging. Um, but what's interesting in, is that in the aftermath of this massacre, uh, public opinion actually starts to shift um, because you have this very inglorious scene of British, British troops um, fighting British people. Uh, it's a long way from the glorious military scenes of Waterloo that we've just seen. And in fact, the name given to this, um, satirically, it became known as the Peterloo Massacre, as, um, as in the Battle of Waterloo, the Peterloo Massacre from St. Peter's Fields. Um, so it became uh, this kind of inglorious moment, a kind of inglorious twin, if you like, to the Battle of Waterloo. Um, but it demonstrates some of the levels of repression that were being seen at this time. These are the sorts of things that Blake was worried about. These are the sorts of things um, that uh, Shelley is warning us about. 
when he's uh, he's critical of the um, authoritarian and repressive figure of Ozymandias. Now, the Romantic poets then, um, it's a name used to describe a group of writers working at this time, not always uh, really with any particular relation to each other. Um, it includes each of these three poets, um, Blake, Wordsworth and Shelley, as well as figures like Lord Byron, John Keats, Robert Southey, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, figures like um, like these. And again, um, interested in many things, but including ideas about the sublime and this redefining of our relationship with nature. And also, um, particularly, this idea of exploring the relationship between, as it were, geographical discovery and personal exploration, self-discovery. So this idea that if you go on a journey through a landscape, you're not merely learning about that landscape, but you're learning about yourself as well. These are the kind of ideas that are wrapped up in it. Now, in summary then. So, let's begin with Ozymandias then, first of all. So, firstly then, it can be seen as a sort of historical parallel for the hubris and nemesis of Napoleon and the leaders like him. In other words, the figure of Ozymandias, or Ramses the Great, um, that is depicted in this poem can be seen as a kind of historical parallel. He, uh, Ozymandias was arrogant and he fell, Napoleon was arrogant and he fell, and the same thing will happen to anybody else who tries. Secondly though, it can be seen as a warning to the British government on the dangers of repression. Ozymandias is not re re remembered as a kindly or a benevolent ruler, but as a tyrant, and it's a sort of warning that this is what would happen to the British government and to the British monarchy. Um, these are sort of some precise um, uh, purposes. However, there are also more universal messages here. For example, we can see it then as a sort of comment on the dangers of ambition and hubris more widely for anyone, not simply um, authority figures, but for all of us. Um, and so related to that, this idea of a reminder of man's insignificance and the need for our humility in the face of a sublime nature, but perhaps even before God also, um, although this, this is rather a pagan poem, but it's a very Christian message, a reminder that we must be humble. Um, and perhaps a growing awareness that nature is not something that we can tame or control. Um, for London then, there's quite a lot going on here, um, a lot of which is surrounded about the particular interest of Blake himself as a, um, as a poet. Now before I talk about the notes on the left, let's just look at the image on the right. Now William Blake, um, his day job as it were, he was a printer, uh, an engraver and an illustrator. Um, on a very small scale, he mainly worked with his wife. Um, and so when these poems were first finished, that were first published, um, they were published in small volumes that he actually made and printed himself. Um, and not um, merely that, but uh, he, <coughs> he and his wife would hand color these images. So each I mean, he only made very small quantities, but each um, each individual one was unique for that reason. And they were only um, a, a circulated among his friends, really, until, I think, at least the 1820s, when he actually is then published more widely. Um, but you'll see as a, here this illustration. Now, at the top of the um, page, you have this old bowed figure. Now, he's not explicitly named, but from other illustrations which Blake um, does, uh, he seems to be this invented mythological figure that Blake created called Eurism. Um, now, that name is seen to be a sort of pun on the idea of reason. Um, this idea that this old man symbolizes reason and order. Um, and if that's the case then, it's interesting that for this illustration he shows this figure of reason and order, this Eurism, 
so beaten down by the dreadful um, state of society that this poem depicts. However, oh, well, well, on that basis, therefore, it's possible that this um, that, that the speaker in the poem may be seen as this voice of reason, like this Eurism figure. But it's interesting that he's being led forward by this child. Is this, therefore, perhaps a suggestion of hope? Um, it's been argued that what you can see toward the right-hand side of this um, image is a shaft of light coming through an open door. Um, it's argued, therefore, that possibly this child uh, offers the key to a more optimistic future, although that's by no means uh, completely clear. Um, so, what then is worth being said? Well, first of all, the poem was um, published in one of his little volumes called Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience. Um, so you'll see how that explicitly relates to the ideas of Rousseau that we talked about at the beginning of this uh, presentation. Um, specifically, it uh, appeared within the section called Songs of Experience. In other words, this poem is very clearly talking about the way that society has been corrupted. Um, so that makes good sense. What can we say about it then? Well, it's an exploration of, um, and also I think a warning against, the consequences of repression, both at home and abroad. There are depictions here, like the Thames, that are clearly of London, but when you have images like blood down palace walls, I think that's a clear allusion to the French Revolution, and so very much um, the home and abroad element. I also think we can see it as this indictment of life for the poor, um, the conditions in which they're living in this new urban, uh, urbanised, increasingly urbanised society. Um, and, you know, the hypocritical consequences of a government which seeks to control lives, the chartered streets that it talks about, but that does nothing to improve them. Um, We've mentioned a criticism of the corruption of society, and particularly the corruption of childhood, again relating back to the idea of innocence as something which is destroyed. Um, a criticism of the effects of the Industrial Revolution, including surrounding the growing urbanisation that we've earlier mentioned. A criticism of the effects of the revolution in France and the warning that it could happen here, which again links back to the idea of repression. And finally, um, an assertion of the role of the poet as a kind of visionary a sort of guiding figure, um, and in he uh, in, in in the introduction which Blake wrote to go with um, the uh, these poems, he described the poet as someone who, and I quote, the present, past, and future sees. Um, so in a sense, he almost sees himself as a kind of prophet figure. Um, now. In terms of his precise views on authority, it's also worth noting this as well. Um, he was a member of a small Protestant Christian sect known with the excellent name of the Swedenborgians, um, after a Swede called Emanuel Swedenborg, who was their founder. Um, they had several key beliefs, um, including that they do not really believe in authority. It's almost slightly puritanical in the sense that they believe in this direct connection between a man's conscience and God without much need for intermediaries in between. So they don't believe in authority other than the Bible or hierarchies either in the church or in society. So for example in the Swedenborgian sect there are no bishops for example. Um, so again you can see how Blake would have resented this feeling of control, chartered and so on. Um, this idea that they also believed in personal freedoms, that is to say the superiority of your own conscience to decide what you should and shouldn't do, um, and the importance of being a good person. This idea that, and I quote, faith without charity is not faith. Faith and charity are intertwined. In other words, it's no good believing in Christianity, for example, if you don't also have good deeds to back that up. That is a key tenet. 
So in a sense, he's very much an anti-authoritarian figure, um, Blake. Now, the final thing then. Uh, in terms of the extract from the prelude, um, it's worth noting there briefly, uh, the first version of this was published in 1798. Um, uh, Words was published a second version in 1805, but he actually continued revising it and working on it right the way up to his death in 1850. He never deemed it to be finished. Um, and how can we see this then? Well, first of all, we can see it as an escape from the horrors of contemporary urbanism and uh, politics and revolution. Um, although it's worth noting that although it begins in that way, it doesn't really end in the same way because he ends terrified of this refuge. In a sense, it, his naive desire for comfort is shown to be futile. Um, we can also think about it as this sort of metaphorical representation of the journey from innocence to experience or the coming of age, again symbolised by the changing perceptions of the landscape. He goes from seeing the landscape at the beginning as something that is fundamentally benevolent uh, and welcoming to something which in actual fact he finds terrifying and even traumatic. Um, what else then? A metaphorical representation of his realisation of humility, this insignificance of mankind in the world, represented by the sublime uh, of the huge peak that he is confronted with. Um, but even we can think about it as a representation of his journey from a youthful revolutionary, somebody who was supportive of the French Revolution. In fact, he actually spent several years in France from 1791 to 93 and even fathered a daughter there. Um, and his move away from that towards um, being a much more conservative figure as an adult um, and indeed becomes an establishment figure when he is made Poet Laureate in 1843. In a sense, he's travelled a very long way from being a youthful revolutionary. It's worth noting, actually, uh, while we're on that subject, that Blake, too, was an early supporter of the revolution. In fact, in 1792, he took to wearing a red hat, which was the symbol of the, the revolutionaries around London, to show his sympathy. But that he, too, very quickly became appalled at the way in which this noble attempt had been damaged and corrupted by the violence and the infighting that broke out afterwards. Um, two more points on this, then. Um, a metaphorical study of... Um, psychological trauma and its effects, the way in which he's haunted by this um, through the rest of the poem. And finally, it's also been seen, I think, l of all these interpretations, the least convincingly, but it's also been seen as a metaphorical representation of sexual discovery, the way in which that he so coquettishly describes how, you know, one evening he's led by her, it's rather ambiguously. Um, it's presented almost as a kind of seduction that he is experiencing. Um, and so that is a possible interpretation, although really I think it's more of this idea of a kind of nature, um, especially at the beginning, it's this idea of a kind of benevolent nature that he is finding himself to be seduced by, rather than it being um, something that is more sexualized. But nonetheless, that is an interpretation that you will... Uh, occasionally see. Um, I hope then that this has provided some good detail for the background for these three poems um, and I, it's very much intended to be used in complement with uh, videos on the three poems specifically um, and individually uh, going through each one so I hope that this will provide some valuable detail for that. Uh, thank you very much for listening.